mathematic success. And so I wanted to just start off by kind of orienting ourselves within kind of the knowledge that we might already have with some uh, common practices as we teach math that are good to just keep in the back of our minds uh, as we learn about some of these indig indigenous pedagogies and strategies, because uh, I think you'll see a lot of similarities between some of these things as we um, learn about this today. So uh, some of the things that came to my mind as I was trying to just kind of compare and contrast the two and, and really hone in on those similarities were um, project-based learning, ways to implement math manipulatives, uh, the ways that we approach the problem-solving strategies, uh, implementing real-world applications, and also uh, the practice of math talks. So just some things to kind of keep in the back of our mind um, as we're starting our conversation with these indigenous pedagogies. So the first thing that I wanted to share with you guys today is this guide that came out of Canada and it's called Pulling Together. It's a guide for indigenization of post-secondary institutions. And even though this is geared towards higher education, um, one thing that I really liked about this resource was that they actually have six different versions of it. And each of these versions, which are listed on the side here, um, and I do have them linked and Quick side note, I will have these slides uploaded into that shared drive. They're not currently at the moment, um, but once we get done today and wrapped up, I will be uploading them so you can go back and access the links. But um, I do have several resources linked throughout the presentation for you to go back and, and have access to later on. So um, they have six different um, versions of this guide that uh, is kind of geared towards a different audience within education. And so I've been working a lot uh, from their curriculum developers guide. And so they have some frameworks that I've kind of adapted that I would like to share with you today in relation to indigenous pedagogies. Uh, but before I do that, one thing that I really like to highlight from this guide is the cover art that they put on each of these manuals. And they share an artist statement in the front of this guide that I would like to share with you because I think it's um, really relevant to what we're talking about today and also might help kind of shed some perspective on how you might feel that you could play your own part in this. So um, the artist statement says that this image was inspired by the annual gathering of ocean going canoes through tribal journeys and pulling together created by Kawakawa artist Luan Neal is intended to represent the connections that each of us has to our respective nations and also to one another as we pull together. Working toward our common visions, we can move forward in sync so we can continue to build and manifest strong, healthy communities with foundations rooted in our ancient ways. So I always like to highlight that because I think it's important to recognize that this is work that we cannot do on our own and we really all need to be um, just doing our own part to really make it all work together in sync. So with that, this um, again came out of that uh, curriculum um, instructor's guide from that pulling together frame or from the pulling together guide, um, I adapted their indigenous pedagogy framework. So they broke it into four main components um, when you're thinking about ways to meaningfully implement these um, indigenous pedagogies. And those are making sure that those uh, learning strategies are holistic and really focusing on the whole child community and um, just looking at the big picture of things. Um, placing emphasis on experiential learning and really having that hands-on approach, making sure that the learning is place-based or land-based, and also providing opportunities for intergenerational learning and really finding ways to connect the youth with those elders and knowledge keepers to, to reinforce that traditional um, way of teaching and learning. So those were the four components that came out of that guide. And I added the center part because I was really trying to think what was at the core of all of this. And everything that I kept coming back to is really based on relationality. And so really just coming at it from the perspective of thinking how all of these things are related and how we can use them and have them working in sync with one another to create that holistic model for the success of our kids. 
So there is a Micmac elder from Canada, Albert Marshall, and he coined this term two-eyed seeing. And I recently came across this um, in a couple of different research capacities that I was I was working on recently. And I really thought it was the best summary that I found of um, kind of the underlying goal of what I think is the underlying goal of most of us that are working within the field of indigenous education. Um, and that is, so he coined this phrase as two-eyed seeing, and it can be further understood as the gift of multiple perspectives treasured by many indigenous people. And our world today has many arenas where this realization, this gift is exceedingly relevant, including especially education, health, and environment. Um, and he also goes on to describe two-eyed seeing as learning to see from your one eye with the best or the strengths in the indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and then learning to see from your other eye with the best or the strengths in the mainstream or Western knowledges and ways of knowing, but most importantly, learning to see with both of those eyes together for the benefit of all. And this is also tying back to those categories on the last slide of bringing in those experiential and intergenerational ways of teaching um, and really just weaving those together. So just thinking about it in terms of we're not trying to when we're thinking about how to how to implement these math strategies, we're not trying to replace or say these methods are better than these Western knowledge systems, but really trying to find ways to meaningfully weave them together to kind of meet both of those worlds and, and both of those um, ways of teaching and learning. So I also really liked the, the way that he explained this is he specifically said um, using each of these lenses to see the strengths and really focusing on seeing the best in both of these systems. And I've also been doing a lot of work lately within a strength-based approach. And it's also sometimes known as an asset-based approach. And it has its foundation in social work and it builds upon the student's strengths and especially seeing the student as resourceful and resilient when they are in adverse conditions. And I taught seventh grade math last year, and I would be willing to bet that a good percentage of them would, would say that math class could be considered an adverse condition. Um, so really just finding ways to uh, make it more meaningful and um, thinking, thinking about it from that asset-based perspective versus the deficit-based perspective that a lot of our um, current data reporting standards are based on, especially within the education system. Um, so it's important to really highlight those. And within these strength-based approaches, they have nine guiding principles. And I think it's important to highlight these um, as I think they can be useful also in um, just ways that we teach not just math, but, but all subjects and just the way we interact with kids overall. Um, both in and out of the classroom. So those nine guiding principles, um, bear with me. I just want to run through these real quick because I do think they are just really important. The first one being everyone possesses a uniqueness that helps them evolve and move along their journey. These unique characteristics can include potential strengths and capabilities. What receives attention or focus becomes what the student strives for and it eventually becomes a reality. You need to be careful with your words and language. Our language creates our reality. Accept change. Our lives and our world are ever evolving. Don't resist. Support others as authentically as you can. You will see that your relationships are deeper and more meaningful. The student is the storyteller of their own life. Build upon what you know and experience to dream about the future. Capacity building has multiple facets and organization. You need to be flexible. And lastly, be collaborative, be adaptive and value differences. So all of this being said, I know so far it's like, what does this even have to do with math? But I promise it's all related, coming back to the relationality. So um, there is this wonderful woman named Dr. Meredith Hecker, who is from Montana. And she recently um, did a research study and she actually presented 
on her research study, uh, along with her colleagues that, that collaborated on this research with her at our in-person conference last month in Helena. Um, but she had some really interesting findings that I thought were important to highlight. So um, this is actually our Indian Education for All um, Making Montana Proud poster series for 2023, and she was one of the ones featured on it. So this was uh, um, just an image that I took from that poster series. And if you don't have that, Mike's an awesome person to hit up for those because he can tell you how to get those. So not to put you on the spot, Mike, but <laughs> um, they really are a great poster series if you haven't had a chance to look at them. They're also on our um, OPI website. So Dr. Hecker um, did this research project where she thought it was important to take that strengths-based approach um, and applied it to the um, data that was reported on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP assessment, which um, is one of the, the biggest data collection procedures on standardized testing um, that we have in the country. So her team um, took the results and instead of looking at all of the, you know, deficient data standard data points that we typically have and that we look at, um, they, the research question that they were focusing on was what are the strengths of American Indian and Alaska Native students in mathematics on the NAEP exam? And so they discovered in existing literature, there had been no research that investigated the strengths of our Native students on a standardized test. And so as they did this research, um, they implemented two conceptual frameworks. So they utilized that asset or strength-based approach that we just talked about on the last couple of slides. And then they also utilized the five R's of indigenous research, the guiding principles and the four or sorry, the five R's that they um, based their research on were relationship, respect, reciprocity, relevance, and responsibility. So I think it's important to just highlight that they also, not only was this research done on our native students' data collection that's already happening, by, so it was focused on our native youth, it was researched by an indigenous researcher, and it also, was rooted at the core in these um, traditional research methodologies and really making sure that they are um, respecting those traditional um, ways of teaching and learning and, and doing it in a responsible way that, that does build on those relationships and that relationality piece. Um, and these principles provided guidance on how they conducted their research, um, how they made connections of their knowledge, and also how they approached shared and use their knowledge. So from their research, they found, I believe there were 14 questions that they identified um, where our American Indian students scored higher on that NAEP exam um, compared to their non-Native peers. And so from those 14 questions that um, Native students continually scored higher on, um, they they took time and they broke it into different themes that they noticed. So they identified eight themes throughout these questions um, that they determined were successful. And the, the themes that they identified, the similarities between these questions, um, a lot of them had diagrams, meaning the question contained a diagram or a visual representation within the question. The question somehow incorporated everyday life it related to the context students have likely experienced in their everyday lives. It involved a lot of geometry with measurement, transformations, unit conversions. Um, the question was somehow related to construction and required the construction or creation of a mathematical object. It somehow included 3D objects or concepts. And there was also um, some component of culture, meaning the question contained a context or a visual representation um, related to a situation that our Native students have likely had through a cultural experience. So one thing that I do want to note with these themes, these eight themes that they identified doesn't necessarily mean that each question met all of these eight themes, but within those 14 questions, they were able to um, determine these to be kind of the most commonly occurring themes. 
So the one question, they provided some examples, and I um, I will give you the research report also um, linked in the resource folder, because they do give you some example questions of the, um, the ones that had been um, found to be successful. And so this was one that really stood out to me. Um, so you have a, an image of a, a slice of wood and it says the circumference of a circular piece of wood is 36 pi centimeters. What is the diameter of the piece of wood in centimeters? So one of the researchers, one of the collaborators on this project, um, through her commentary, set, uh, made a comment about this specific question, saying that our Native students got this hard eighth grade geometry question correct one and a half times as often as their non-American Indian Alaska Native peers. This is a different vision contrasting the overall achievement gap literature. And this was something that really stood out to me. Um, so my position within the OPI, uh, my, my job title is Tribal Student Achievement Specialist. And so having to research what is labeled as the achievement gap is something that I have to do a lot. And it is very as they previously said, very deficit-based. And it can get um, a little discouraging at times when you're constantly just looking at like all this data that they make bright red. And so really trying to think of ways that we can reframe this and using something such as images or objects or really just building on those experiential um, components, I think is just so important. So now taking the research that they put together and thinking about how we can build upon those themes, build upon those strengths, um, and applying that to just kind of the, the basic foundations of, of teaching math. So what came to my mind was, as we think about math concepts increasing in difficulty, you really build from that concrete level up to the abstract level and ultimately to the symbolic level. And one thing that I noticed through reading all of these different research reports and, and trying to just kind of compare the different strategies and methods that are implemented is there's a big focus on um, this concrete understanding. And I know that this is really emphasized a lot, I feel like in the earlier elementary grades as kids are starting to learn to count and do basic adding and subtracting, but um, I feel especially as, as kids progress through school and they get older, we tend to kind of veer away from more of those concrete um, experiential learning experiences and really focus more on the abstract and symbolic piece and thinking more of it in a, in a procedural sense. So um, I really wanted to try to think about ways that we could build more on those concrete learning methods. So when we think about how to implement these things and we, so <laughs> trying to tie it all together, um, thinking of relationality and how all of these things are related. So going back to the two-eyed seeing that we discussed earlier and thinking about how we can view that both through what we have already learned in most of our teacher prep programs of mainstream and Western knowledge, and then how we can also incorporate those indigenous pedagogies and frameworks within that as well. So thinking about the mainstream um, concepts behind uh, this concrete phase of learning math, Jerome Bruner concluded in 1986 that learning reflects a social process in which children engage in dialogue and discussion with themselves as well as with others, including teachers as they develop intellectually. Um, we can also label this as, um, you know, the constructivist method and really focusing on how the stimulus and the outcome are related to one another. Um, I mean, there's there's lots of terms and different educational theories that we can apply when we think about it in terms of the Western knowledge systems. But when we try to incorporate those indigenous knowledge systems, um, we really need to think about it in the sense that knowledge is relation relational. It's not just interpersonal relationships between teachers and students, but rather 
the relationships with all of creation. And this suggests this suggests that students are involved not only in uh, manipulating materials, discovering patterns, inventing their own algorithms, and generating different solutions, but it also um, emphasizes sharing their observations, describing relationships, explaining procedures, and defending the processes they followed. So again, just thinking of ways that we can really weave those two things together. So the next thing that I would like to share um, is this short video. And I, I found this because I thought it was just such a great example of how these teachers implemented that land and place-based learning. And they really had that as their primary goal. They started with those indigenous pedagogies as their baseline, and then they found ways to bring math into it from that point. So I thought this was a really good example just of how you can kind of go about doing that. Um, and there is a, actually a, a YouTube playlist that I do share in the resources that has a total of four videos. So this was just one of the videos that I pulled that specifically focuses on land-based learning, um, but I will share those others with you um, at the end so that you can, if you want access to the other examples as well. Today we are at Josh's house and we are about to embark on a little bit of a walk and we are going to be immersing ourselves in traditional knowledge and making those connections to mathematics. I had this vision back in uh, 2006, 2007 when I came home and I was under a depression and then, you know, this sort of land kind of got, got me out of that depression. And the only way that I got out of that depression, I had to come back home. The grassroots level of where you come from. That's the very importance of our identity, eh? So when you connect with the land, with this process of what you're doing, is healing yourself. The reason I came was just for the experience. There's a lot of things that I know um, I hear about that I just don't have the background knowledge for. So coming and getting to participate in the ceremonies and the circles and going for the medicine walk um, just gives me different ideas of how I can take this knowledge and then we can work the math into it. There's a lot of confusion about what math should look like and the new math is referred to as discovery math. And the problem with that is that's the idea that, you know what, if I take my students out on this nature walk, the math's just going to come out and they're going to learn it. Hmm. And it's not the truth. They're going to see different bits, but then it's my role as an educator. What questions can yeah. I ask or what follow-up activities can I do that are going to reinforce those math concepts so they see them in the everyday life, but then they can also use them. That's it, right? Though it's it's identifying what's the student interested in. And if they start asking questions about it, that's where your investigation comes in and that's where you bring the math in. So even just looking at the structure, like what angles are we using? Why the size of wood? What, how does this work? And some of our best math students, they don't necessarily know the standard algorithm, like how to multiply two digit by two digit numbers together, but they can do it just as quick because they've figured out other tricks. Mm. So there's not just one way of knowing math. And I think that's what this project really reinforces. Step out of the idea of um, our sort of, well, this is my opinion, but our siloed subjects that we have. Um, when we approach something, um, it's more about what, I guess, aspects of healing it would provide, the project, and then we look at that um, expectation or curriculum piece afterwards. Well, I see this as an awesome way to engage kids experientially. We need to really drastically take a different approach to how we're doing things in education. 
it's also an opportunity to um, teach in a good way and really let the land be our teacher. I think the Western way of doing mathematics is really rooted in paper, pencil, and repetition. But, um, and I think a lot of our Indigenous youth struggle with that because inherently it's rooted in the way that we do things. And it's just there. And we just don't articulate and specify that it's mathematics. It's just a way of being. It's showing our Indigenous youth that they can do mathematics and that it lives within their past and their history and when we do those things in the classroom it brings those things back to the surface. There's not just one way of knowing math and I think that's what this project really reinforces that everyone looks at it in different ways. It's developing that deeper understanding of math so it's not just about here's the set of procedures that I have to follow to get the answer, here's the formula I follow, it's why am I doing it and why does it work. Okay, so I really enjoy, uh, enjoy that video because I think they highlight some really important things, um, especially as the, the one woman was talking about how a lot of times when we think about discovery learning or experiential learning, you know, you might take your kids outside and go on a walk and then just expect that math learning to occur. So really thinking about our roles as educators once we are in those situations or maybe even after the fact, but thinking about what questions we can ask students or what meaningful activities we can plan uh, to follow up and continue building on that. Uh, and really, again, just focusing on that conceptual knowledge versus that procedural knowledge. So, so some strategies that you can implement within your own classroom to help uh, pull some of these things in, the first one being having students participate in more of those real world experiences, um, finding things that are meaningful to them, finding things that um, get them interested in learning. And even if it doesn't seem relevant at the time, um, you might be surprised ways that we can find connections with math. And I think another added layer of challenge for kids is if you ask them to, to find those math connections within those activities that they enjoy, because they will probably be even more surprised. But also really focusing on that culturally relevant piece. And the more that you can pull in those cultural components, the more impactful that learning experience will be. Um, when we talk about these Indigenous learning methods, there are really strong foundations of community. and just like I put in that framework, really having that relationality piece at the core of Indigenous ways of teaching and learning. So continuing to build upon those ways um, and also building upon the strengths of the families. Um, I know it's been touched on several times. Uh, I think Matt discussed it in his keynote a little bit too, but um, Education hasn't always been the most positive experience for our Native students and um, our Native families and communities. So really also finding ways to encourage that family support. Um, and that might include providing some of those specific strategies to the parents to help them understand their kids homework as well so that they you know they might be learning alongside with them but really just making sure you have that support there as well and inviting them into the classroom um, you can also create opportunities for meaningful intergenerational learning experiences if you live within a tribal community invite elders in from your community to share their knowledge and teachings and uh, really emphasize that that traditional way of teaching um, identify the current strengths of your students. And this is one that I, I think can be implemented rather quickly and easily and really across all subjects, but really, really focusing on building on the strengths of your students. Um, I was also reading uh, 
uh, Joe Bowler is, is kind of a math guru and she has some great articles that uh, I'll provide for you as well, but she really focuses on how you can use um, just kind of the difference between number sense and fluency and focusing on how the procedural processes of math, while it might lead to a correct answer with kids, is not going to help them understand that process. And so if you find a strength that your students currently have, and you know that you need to get them up to this higher level, sometimes you might need to rework your units. So I know um, one example that I was, was looking at, usually geometry, um, when we're teaching middle school math is towards the, the end of the year, but the teacher noticed that that was the strength of their students. So they moved the geometry unit to the very first one of um, up to the front of the line. And that way the kids really built up their confidence um, and wanted to, to continue going in that sense. And it helped reduce their math anxiety. Um, and then the last thing that I think is just kind of the simplest thing that is just so easy to implement, but there's been a lot of research also when we think about just relationality to some of these word and story problems, something as easy as the first step being when you see your word problem, cross out all the names in the problem and replace them with your name or names of your friends. And so when kids go through and read those word problems, they are more connected to the question, they are thinking of it in real life sense because they're picturing um, that scenario actually playing out. There we go. So some helpful resources that I wanted to um, provide to you guys. This first one being um, Indigenous Mathology Little Books. So I know in the last slide, one of the suggestions that I provided was, um, you know, if you if you have access to um, knowledge keepers or elders in your community and, and wanting to bring them in to help um, implement that experiential and intergenerational learning, but maybe you live in more of an urban area or you might not have access to some of those resources, um, invite a parent in to, to read a book or, you know, share a story. And so I really liked these um, Indigenous mythology books. These are also based out of Canada, um, but they're just really great picture books. And it's a, a list that gives you, um, it kind of breaks it up by topic too and domain based on what um, concept you might be teaching. Um, but I thought those were really interesting. Um, I also provided a Indigenous Knowledge and Mathematics Community of Practice YouTube list. That was the video that we just previously watched. Um, that's the, the full list with the other three video examples, if you want to access those. Um, and then there's this article, uh, Bringing a Culturally Responsive Lens to Math Class. And I wanted to include this. So this teacher talking about finding ways to pull in those student interests and student experiences. She basically did just that. And she uh, kind of just put it up to her kids what they wanted to learn about, what topic was important to them. So they did a three week um, research project that they connected to current events um, and national news. And then they basically did a kind of a collaborative research project. But again, it just pulls in those, those experiential um, opportunities and also builds on that um, interest and engagement. Uh, REL Northwest um, has a online training series uh, with some recorded webinars focused on building positive math attitudes. And so that um, they have videos and then they also have some um, PDF resources as well. And then lastly, I wanted to link the um, EFA math lessons that we have provided on our um, OPI Indian Education for All webpage. Uh, we currently have four math lessons posted on there. Um, 
and they're they're chunked by by grade level. So we have one that is K2, one for three, five, one for six, eight, and one for nine, twelve. Um, and while they do cover grade bands, um, there's a lot of ways that you can break those up and and adjust them uh, depending on if you need to you know scaffold up or down depending on the grade level or needs of your students. Um, so that's also something that I wanted to give you access to. And then in the resource folder, um, I'm also gonna give you some resources um, relating to, I'll give you the article for the strength-based resource or the strength-based um, approaches, as well as some resources on land and place-based learning that I hope you will find helpful. So with that, um, I would like to just thank you all for spending some time with me today. I know we have a few minutes left, but um, I did wanna leave some time. If anybody wants to ask any questions or, or even just have a discussion, if you have um, maybe specific challenges you're facing in your own classroom in regards to implementing some of these things, um, or if you just have any clarifying questions, but I'd really like to just open it up for any kind of discussion or questions, if anybody has anything they'd like to, to add or share. And if not, I'm gonna kick it back to Mike with some more jokes. <laughs> um, thank you, Jordan. I mean, Morgan, geez, I just called you Jordan. I, I have Jordan Mike, I'm gonna start just, you know, keeping tallies, honestly, I've always, as Morgan, I have always been called Megan. That's always been what what gets um, my name confused with. But lately, it's been Jordan, and I don't know if it's just because of this job because we work with Jordan so much. But that's been a new experience for me. Usually, I get called Megan and not Jordan. <laughs> uh, it's funny because I got Jordan's name written down in front of me here. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for sharing what you shared there and. Um, some good resources for math and just EFA in general and how we approach things. So, yeah, you, you reminded me of a math statistic, though. Um, I just saw a stat that said five out of four kids have trouble with fractions. So. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I I think that that uh, I feel like it's probably more than five out of four, but I could be wrong. <laughs> And then the other one, remember that the, the student was having a really hard time with algebra. So he wrote a note to his teacher and left it on her desk. And it said, uh, dear algebra, quit trying to find your ex. She's never coming back. I've seen that one. <laughs> and, then he, and then he put a PS on there. PS, don't ask why. So, but, oh, there's one okay. question that came up. Um, so you got like the minute and a half to answer this here, Jordan. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Morgan. I just called the Jordan again. Morgan. All right. How do we navigate district expectations of using the adopted materials and the desire to bring in more experiential project-based learning? Um, that's a really good question. So I'm going to say, it, and it really varies by district. I'm going to try to answer this as best as I can in 60 seconds. Um, but I am happy to connect on this more later on because I'm going to be honest, I'm not familiar with IntuMath. Um, but I just through my own experiences, I usually use the curriculum that's provided just as kind of a baseline um, as far as planning out um, like the overall math lessons. But starting with that is kind of your framework. And then again, finding ways to pull in those project based um, and experiential learning opportunities is I don't want to say they're supplemental or an afterthought, but when you're working in a framework like that, where you do have district expectations of, of the curriculum, um, just finding ways that, and it might be when you're thinking in terms of assessment, maybe you're replacing a written assessment with um, like a performance assessment, or you're using those um, project-based learning experiences as your assessment. So um that's just kind of a quick, short 60 second. I know that probably didn't answer your full question, but um, that's just kind of my own advice. And please feel free if any of you have questions now or maybe later on. I know sometimes I don't think of questions until way after. Um, 
but please feel free to email me. And I'm also very much the type of person that just likes to have conversations and brainstorm things out loud because that's how I make sense of things. So always happy to do that too. Um, so feel free to reach out if you ever um, want to chat. Yeah, Morgan, would you drop your email and chat yeah. so folks can have that? And you know, something else I saw real quick, and then we'll take a short break and we'll start again promptly at 10, is uh, Jason Cummins at Co Agency School had his teachers just get together and look at their reading, you know, their standard reading curriculum they were using. And then they mapped out, you know, ways they could kind of weave in EFA content throughout that, you know, set reading series. And so, um, I thought that was kind of a cool model just to he was working to ensure that they kept, you know, indigenous stories, you know, weave throughout that kind of standard curriculum they had there. So I thought yeah, that was kind absolutely. of a cool model. But um, but thank you so much, Morgan. And uh yeah. we'll take a short break here and come back at 10 o'clock. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for spending your Saturday morning with me. Like I said, um, those resources are not in the folder at the moment, but once I get logged off here, I will, I will, that's my next step is to get those uploaded. So I would say in the next 30 minutes, it should be all up to date. So thank you all again. Hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your conference. Yeah, and we'll start again here at 10 o'clock.